Factor analysis is a complex topic, and when you run factor analysis in SPSS, you get a lot of output. Some of this output is used to assess whether or not the data are suitable for factor analysis, whereas some of it presents the results of the actual analyses. I'll provide you with a quick overview of the key points to consider, but for further information you should consult some of the references on the StatHand website or app. The first table of output is a correlation matrix. In the top portion you can see the intercorrelations amongst participants' responses to the 12 items on the Humor questionnaire. There are a number of substantial looking correlations here. So for example, the correlation between item 1, which is I like to make fun of others, and item 5, which is I frequently make others the target of my jokes, is 0.749. A number of substantial correlations in this matrix suggest the presence of one or more underlying factors. If all of the correlations in this matrix are close to zero, you should be wary about running factor analysis as you're likely to extract as many factors as you have items. Now underneath the correlation matrix is the determinant. And this is an indicator of multicollinearity. If it's higher than 0 0.00001, as it is here, then multicollinearity is not a problem. Now the second table, which I'll just scroll down to, contains the kaiser mayer olkin measure of sampling adequacy and Bartlett's test of sphericity. These are additional measures that we can use to check that the data are suitable for factor analysis. It's recommended that the KMO be above a minimum of about 0.6 and Bartlett's test be significant, which they are here. And for information on how to interpret these statistics, please consult some of the references in StatHand. Now the third table is called the anti-image matrices. And the only thing that you need to check in this table are the measures of sampling adequacy which appear to run down the diagonal of the second part of the table. So these figures indicate the degree to which each item is correlated with all of the others in the correlation matrix. Now ideally all of these individual measures of sampling adequacy should be above about 0.6. And any items with individual measures of sampling adequacy below this should be considered as candidates for removal from the scale. Now here, they're all above our 0.6 threshold. Now the next table reports the initial and extracted communalities. Initial communalities represent the proportion of shared variance in each item. The initial communality for item 1, for example, is 0 0.690, and this means that 0.69 of the variance in item 1 can be accounted for by the other 11 items in combination. And obviously, the higher these values are, the better. Now, the extracted communalities indicate the proportion of shared variance in each item, which can be accounted for by the extracted factors in combination. And again, the higher these figures are, the better. Now if you look at item 7, it has a low initial communality, indicating that only 28% of its variance can be accounted for by the other variables in combination. Furthermore, only a small amount of that shared variance, 21.5%, can be accounted for by the extracted factors. So in other words, the extracted factors are doing a poor job of predicting how participants respond to this item. And this means that we should keep a close eye on this item, item 7, as we continue reading through the output. Now the total variance explain table tells us how many factors have been extracted using principal axis factoring. Now remember the rule that we set for extracting factors was the Kaiser criterion. And the Kaiser criterion says that we should extract factors with initial eigenvalues greater than 1. For the logic of why we do this, refer to some of the references listed in StatHand. Now here there are two initial eigenvalues greater than 1, and thus two factors have been extracted. The decision to extract two factors is confirmed by the scree plot. And you can see in the scree plot that there are two eigenvalues which clearly stand out from the other 10. So now we're in a position where we know that two factors have been extracted. The next question to ask is, what do these two factors actually look like? And to answer this question, we need to keep scrolling. 
And for now, we're going to scroll past the factor matrix, and we'll also scroll past the reproduced correlations matrix, and we'll stop at the pattern matrix. When you run an oblique rotation, this is generally the table that you'll look at to interpret your factors. It contains what we commonly refer to as factor loadings. Now I've organized this table to make it easy to interpret, and I've done that by sorting the loadings by size and by hiding the very small loadings. So these are loadings which are under 0.3. Now we can see that six items load onto factor one, and all of these items appear to be about making fun of other people. So I might label this factor something like making fun of others or externally directed humor. Now notice that item 12 has a negative loading on factor 1. This is because it's worded in the opposite direction to the other five. We would predict that someone who would strongly agree with an item like, I like to make fun of others, would strongly disagree with an item like, I personally don't like making fun of other people. Now the next five items all load onto the second factor. All of these items appear to be about making fun of oneself. And so I might label this factor something like self-deprecating humor. And then finally, at the bottom of the pattern matrix, we have item 7, which has a weak loading on factor 2. Now, as it's clearly not about making fun of oneself, and as it has low initial and extracted communalities, I think we would have justification for recommending this item be removed from the humor scale when it's next used in research. An alternative would be to suggest developing a number of additional items, tapping sarcasm as a type of humor, and then hoping for three subscales rather than two. Now we can scroll past the structure matrix and we can have a look at the factor correlation matrix next. This tells you the correlations between factors. Now here we've extracted two factors, so there's only one correlation that we need to focus on, which is 0.438. Now, as a rule of thumb, if the correlations between factors are greater than about 0.3 on average, then an oblique rotation like direct oblomen is appropriate. If all the correlations between factors are small, then an orthogonal rotation like Veramax can be used instead. Now, although it's not necessary in this case, running these analyses again with an orthogonal rotation is easy. You just need to repeat the steps that I described in the previous video, except choose Veramax instead of direct oblomen in the rotation dialog. Then when you're interpreting your results, look for something called a rotated factor matrix rather than a pattern matrix. Now finally, we should get a sense of whether our two-factor model is a good model. And there are a number of things that we can look at to do this, including the proportion of variance accounted for by the extracted factors in combination. And in our case, this is 53.92%. We can also look at the initial and extracted communalities. And we can look at the interpretability of the pattern matrix. We can also look at the reproduced correlations matrix to get a sense of goodness and fit. Essentially, we used a correlation matrix, which was the first table of output right at the top of the page, to develop a two-factor model. If this two-factor model is a good model, we should be able to use it to reproduce the original correlation matrix. And this is what we've done in the first part of this table. These are SPSS's best estimates of the correlations between the items based on the two-factor model. In the second part, of the reproduced correlations table, we have something called residuals. Residuals are the raw differences between the original correlations and the reproduced correlations. And the smaller the residuals, the better the model. Now, as a rule of thumb, we want the majority of these residuals to be trivial. And generally speaking, if fewer than 60% of them have absolute values greater than 0.05, we can argue that the model has done a reasonable job of re reproducing the original correlation matrix. Now here, just 28% of the residuals are greater than 0.05, and this is good. Now when you write up the factor analysis, there's quite a lot that needs to be reported. So here's a list of things that you want to make sure that you cover. Firstly, you want to indicate exactly what data was subject to factor analysis. 
And in our case, we'd explain how the 12 factor humor measure was subjected to principal axis factoring using oblique rotation. An oblique rotation was appropriate as the extracted factors correlated 0.438. We'd also explain how we tested univariate normality and bivariate linearity, and there's advice on how to do this in StatHand. And we'd also report what we found. We'd report on the checks that we looked at earlier in this video. So the bivariate correlation matrix indicated a number of substantial correlations. The individual measures of sampling adequacy were all above 0.6, as was the overall kaiser meyer olkin measure of sampling adequacy. We'd report that Bartlett's test was statistically significant and that the determinant was 0.002, and that collectively these checks all suggested that the data was suitable for factor analysis. We would need to explain how two factors were extracted and how they could in combination account for 53.9% of the shared variance in the data. And we would then report the pattern matrix in a nicely formatted table and make sure that we name each of the factors in that table. And we would also provide some evaluation of goodness of fit, making reference to any unusually low communalities, the percentage of redundant residuals over 0.05, and so on. So as I've said previously, there's a lot that you need to take into consideration when running factor analysis. Take your time and use the resources that you have available to you including those that we've listed on StatHand.